My name is Dr. Christine Whitney Miller and we're here at the University of Florida in the Entomology and Nematology Department. And we are here where um, we do a lot of our experiments in my lab. Well, one reason that I think it's really great to be an academic institution is there's an opportunity to, uh, to bring together research, outreach, education, so in my lab, uh, we're called the, the Miller Lab, uh, there's a number of um, undergraduate students, uh, graduate students, technicians, and we have a postdoc coming soon. And, and in my lab, we work on questions related to uh, evolution, behavior, and ecology. So we work um, on those broad, broad areas, but our, our questions specifically are on how uh, the natural environment affects uh, trade expression and evolution. We're um, really excited about how genes in the environment interact to shape phenotypes. So we're obviously, you know, we as humans, but insects as well, are not just a product of their genes. Genes are not just a blueprint for who we are. There's more to it. But we're also not just nurture. We're not just that environment we experience, the friends we have, the, the you know, what our, our parents teach us. We're more than that too. And it's really that interaction between genes and the environment that I find so fascinating. You know, I could go into any room full of people and ask them, each individual, you know, what sort of aesthetics do you look for in a mate? And that they, they would be really variable in that room. And I think that we're starting to see that that's true in animal systems too. And I think that this variation um, is a mechanism for the diversity of life that we see. So one very specific question we're interested in is what, uh, what makes males attractive? What influences female mate choice? And uh, these are questions we can investigate in cactus bugs. You know, I'd been studying fish and they can be really expensive to maintain and they take a lot of effort. I quickly realized that I could answer these questions that I'm interested in easily with this leaf-footed bug system that she's interested in. So what we do is we have some simple differences. We have cactus without fruit and cactus with fruit. And so these are simple differences in, in the ecology of cactus bugs. So cactus bugs, uh, sometimes in, in nature, they have cactus fruit available, and sometimes they don't. And uh, so sometimes they have to grow up without fruit. It turns out cactus fruit is a very um, high quality resource. It's a very valuable to these bugs. And if they have the opportunity to grow up with, with cactus fruit, they end up bigger, they end up more attractive, uh, they end up uh, making different mate choice decisions. And so what we can do is we can keep track of the genetics of these bugs and then change the environment. One of the interesting results from the study that I started my first year here was that Females exhibit plasticity in their mating behaviors based on the environments in which they encounter a male. When females come through, they don't always mate with the males there. So what's going on there? How much that has to do with that current context, that quality of the territory the male is on? How much of it has to do with where that male grew up, if he grew up on a high quality host plant or a low quality host plant? So these are just some of the specifics that we're currently investigating in my laboratory. 21 green fruit. One way that I feel like my lab's making a contribution is we're, we're bringing that sort of ecological perspective to sexual selection. Hey, environments vary, and, and how is that going to then shape phenotypes and, and shape how animals interact? It's not necessarily possible for animals to evolve any particular way and direction and trait combination that's going to make them do best in the environment because there are some genetic constraints. So in terms of behavior, what we're bringing in is some genetic tools that I think are very needed at this time. So while we work largely on the topic of sexual selection, it actually has potential implications across the field of biology. So our hope is through our studies of genotype by environment interaction that we will better understand what maintains genetic variation in natural populations. That's a fundamental question in evolutionary biology. Well, understanding mating systems as a sort of basic knowledge, I think, eventually turns into information that we need to understand about how to maintain populations that are in decline. But our work may also have applications uh, that might be directly relevant to day-to-day -day human life. So for instance, uh, we need to know how uh, males and females find each other to better understand how to control them in pest management strategies. Well, we're learning more and more how complex insects are, that, uh, that early social experiences affect later social behavior, that how they fed as a larva affects um, later mate choice. Like, 
the, the levels keep getting deeper and deeper, and, and they're showing that insects can be very sophisticated, that they aren't simple reflex machines, but instead are more similar to us than, than we might have previously assumed. So with our research, we're you know, trying to be right on the cutting edge of, of, of science and pushing the envelope forward with research. But then we try to take that research and, and communicate it, not just the scientific community, but to the general public so they know what their, their taxpayer dollars are paying for. And also to get people excited. You know, that's, that is, that's a major goal here, is to communicate your own excitement, to, to let people know why you're doing what you're doing. They're pretty easy to find if you look for fresh feeding marks. I think that's probably the freshest here. But there it is. That's maybe a second. Can't really see it from the same. So when we think about what gets people excited about the natural world, the world they live in, uh, often it's it's early childhood experiences, but it's also often animal behavior that grabs people. That's why there's so many of these nature shows. are often focusing on behavior. And if you've ever sat in a uh, university level, college level behavior class, you can see students sometimes jumping out of their seats. They, get, they think it's so cool what animals are capable of doing because we often think of them as much simpler than they really are. So if we really want to show people, if we want to give people, in a way, a gift, a, a greater appreciation for the world they live in, the, the appreciation that when they see a cockroach running across their kitchen floor that they realize, huh, cockroaches are pretty social, they are drawn together by pheromones, and give them that, that gift of a greater understanding and perspective on maybe even their household insects, but also the natural world in general, then um, we teach them about behavior. It, it's going to get people, I guess, in, in enjoying their world more, but it also might get them conserving their world more because they're recognizing the value of nature and the diversity out there that, you know, I talked about cockroaches, but most insects are not pests to us. Most insects are neutral or beneficial, and we often don't know the benefits available. So when I teach my introductory level entomology class, one of my major goals is just showing them how amazing insects are. That in insects are more than just the mosquitoes and cockroaches and termites that uh, they grow to hate, but instead insects are fascinating little creatures. Research and teaching really feed off each other. They um, they belong together in a lot of ways. <laughs> I think you know it's it's through my classes that I get inspired to do new research projects, uh, and through my research I get inspired to teach. And so I try to bring them together at, at every point possible. In my classroom, I'm always bringing up uh, new research studies that just came out, just got published in scientific journals, and I think the students appreciate knowing what is really timely and relevant. Uh, then I. I guess my favorite uh, way to bring this together is bringing undergraduate students into my laboratory. Yeah, there's like two or three. <laughs> Students that come into my lab absolutely have to have research experience, and the reason is is mostly because they need to know they like it. You know, they need to know that they enjoy the process of science. When I was an undergraduate, I got into a lab during my junior year, and I had such an important experience during those those two years that I worked in a lab that ever since that time, I've wanted to return the favor. I think it's really important for someone in an early stage to really get in there and get experiences with all kinds of things. So. For me personally, it was a whole nother level of learning. You kind of get exposed to the skills like giving a talk or mm -hmm. writing a paper. I uh, love working with undergrad students on research projects. It's all new to them and they're really excited to learn and they have fresh perspectives. And so they're helping with research projects that are going to be published that are going to actually form part of the scientific body of knowledge. And at the same time, they get a really amazing learning experience. Your know, students learn certain things from a classroom and in certain fundamental sort of building blocks of their future professions. Uh, but it's how science is taught in the classroom, it just doesn't compare to how science actually proceeds by scientists. You can learn so much in a classroom, uh, but there's limitations in what you can learn. And mainly in the classroom, you're just conceptualizing uh, ideas or or theories or techniques or methods, uh, but actually being in the lab and getting to translate what we're learning in the classroom into real practice, uh, hands-on experience, I think that really set me up um, and really kind of fueled a new passion of science that I, I hadn't had before. 
it's easy to be pretty passive in a classroom. But when you're in there with your hands dirty, you know, holding bugs and measuring them, that's not a passive process. And so they actually were, are going to be learning faster at a faster rate, and their classes are going to make more sense. Being here at an academic institution, I have the opportunity not only to do research, but to, to reach undergraduate students in a way that, that they're not going to be able to be reached otherwise. And so we do research. We connect with undergraduate students that get actively involved in learning. I get everyone in the lab out there doing outreach so we connect to the general public as well. So really it's, it, a lot of it is about connections, taking what we're doing and, and disseminating it, connecting people with other people, working on communication and, and getting the, hopefully, uh, you know, non-scientists really excited about uh, the natural world, about biology and, and hopefully maybe even what, what we're doing in the, our laboratory.